Welcome to the Disney Parks Podcast with your hosts, Tony Castlenova from DisneyByTheNumbers.com and Parkhopper John from WDWParkhoppers.com. Keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the podcast at all times and get ready for the Disney Parks Podcast. We know that coming to Walt Disney World can be very overwhelming with all the fast passes, the dining reservations, even getting from attraction to attraction can be extremely overwhelming. But we've got a friend that can help you make your next trip to Walt Disney World even more magical. It's Ramon and Theme Park Concierges. You can visit themeparkconcierges.com or call them at 407-257-9973. Ramon and his amazing team of VIP concierges will take care of you from the moment you arrive at the park until the moment you go back to your resort. They can take care of you for a four-hour time slot or a full day. It all depends on what you need. They can take care of your dining reservations, your fast passes, and even make sure that you find even more magic hidden in the Disney parks. Well, contact our friends, themeparkconcierges.com, or call 407-257-9973 and tell them your friends over at the Disney Parks Podcast sent you. And now, the Disney Parks Podcast infotainment segment. Hello, everybody. We have got a great show for you. I'm so excited about our guest tonight. Uh, David Bossert is an artist, a filmmaker, an author. Uh, he's a 32-year veteran of the Walt Disney Company and is currently serving as an independent producer and creative di director. He studied at the Character Animation Program at CalArts and received his BFA in animation from the CalArts School of Film and Video. He has an incredible... Uh, biography. I can't even begin to say all the different intellectual properties he's worked on. Well, let's just say, if it's a Disney film, he's probably had his hand in it at some point. Uh, we can't wait to get into his story. Ladies and gentlemen, David, welcome to the Disney Parks Podcast. Hey, guys. Thanks very much for having me on. I appreciate it. That's great. That's great. Uh, we'd like to ask everybody, David, how their journey with uh, Disney began. So how did your uh, journey with Disney begin? Well, you know, it, it was actually kind of interesting. Uh, when I graduated high school in New York, uh, I started going to a college back on Long Island uh, for an advertising art program. I was going to go into advertising in New York, you know, Madison Avenue, Mad Men kind of stuff. Right. And, uh, and I took a TV graphics class. And that was the first time I actually created some animation with my own artwork. Hmm. And right around the same time, uh, a friend of mine handed me an article out of the New York Times that was talking about a school in Valencia, California, California Institute of the Arts, uh, that was uh, essentially training uh, a new crop of artists for the Disney Studios. And I was really more enamored with the animation end of things, so I sent my portfolio out to Cal Arts. And I was fortunate enough to get accepted, and I, I got a Walt Disney scholarship, and I came out to California. I didn't know a soul west of the Mississippi. I mm. came out here by myself in, in a, in a beat-up Volkswagen bug, <laughs> and, and I went to Cal Arts. And, uh, and the crazy thing was, while I was at Cal Arts, you know, a lot of my classmates were real Disney fans. I mean, crazy Disney fans, and they all had their sights set on wanting to work at Disney. And whenever they, you know, it would come up, they'd say, you know what, you know, you, you want to go work at Disney? And I'd say, no, I'm going to go back to New York. I want to do commercials. <laughs> and, uh, and and so when I got out of Cal Arts, I got a small, uh, you know, I got a job in Studio City, California, um, with uh, Don Blues Productions, and I worked on some early video games, Space Ace and Dragon's Lair. And... Wow. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll do that for the summer and into the fall, and then I'll go back to New York for the holidays, and then I'll start looking for a job in Manhattan. And, uh, and then Don Bluth, they went bankrupt, and 
right when that happened, a friend of mine who was working at Disney said, hey, they're looking for some people to come into the effects department uh, for Black Cauldron. Black Cauldron. And so uh, Don Hahn hired me. And Don and I are good friends and have been for, for 30 some odd years now. Wow. But Don hired me uh, into the effects department on the Black Cauldron. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just do this for a little while because then I'm going to get laid off and I'll go back to New York. <laughs> and, uh, and that started this cycle of, like, for the first five pictures I worked on at Disney, I kept thinking, oh, I'll lay me off at the end of this one, then I'll go back to New York, you know? <laughs> After about five movies, I figured, oh, I guess they're going to keep me, and I'm staying out here in California. Wow. wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean... So it, was, it was a lot of fun, you know? I mean, I, I, in fact, I'm adding a new page to my website that's a gallery page, and... And I, I just sent to my webmaster a photo of myself from the Black Cauldron days. Oh, wow. Uh, that, I, that I was going to put up there because I, I just got a kick out of it. And, uh, and what was great about that picture, guys, is that when I finished working in the effects department, I thought for sure I was going to get laid off. Because they wound up laying off. There were 28 of us in the effects department. They laid off 16 people. They only kept 12. Wow. So they basically laid off about two thirds of the department, and uh, and I was shocked that they were keeping me because I was like the last guy hired, and I thought, well, last guy hired, first guy fired, but yeah. that didn't happen. But what they said was they wanted they wanted to keep me, and they said, uh, would you mind uh, helping in the ink and paint department, paint some cells to get black cauldron finished? Wow. And I said, sure, absolutely. And it was one of the best things I ever did in my career because I learned so much about the whole animation pipeline, the process, right. uh, during those couple months that I was helping to finish, uh, you know, helping paint, paint cells to help get that movie finished. Yeah. That's amazing because that's, that's why you went out there in the first place to just kind of learn, you know, some of the basics of animation, and now you're literally getting your hands really dirty. Yeah. learning how to do, yeah, that, do yeah. everything. That's awesome. That's and, great. And, and, you know, it, it really was a terrific experience, I have to say. I, I You know, uh, the Black Cauldron sometimes gets a bad rap from people, but I think when you look at that movie, there's some incredible animation by some budding new talents like Glenn Keane and Phil Niblink and uh, Andreas Deja and people like that that were really kind of early in their careers. They were just... As they were being trained by some of the nine old men that were retiring, and uh, and I think you know uh, the backgrounds in the Black Cauldron are really uh, beautiful. You know, there's obviously some story problems with the film, and it's a bit dark for for some people, but it, it really is an amazing picture. And, and I, like I said, I have a special place in my heart for it because it was my first picture at Disney. Yeah. Wow. You know. And, and you say something that we've heard on the show many times from some of the animation people is uh, they were hired, they did a film, and then they expected to get laid off at the end. And it seems like either the, I guess the studios just hire you know as many people as they can to get the project done, and then when the project's over, everybody or a good majority of the people seem to go away. Well, you know, you got to realize that. Um, during that time, this is we're talking 1984, 1985. Right. There was uh, there was a financier on Wall Street, Saul Steinberg, who were, had built up a big stock position in Disney. He was trying to take over the company because he felt like the company was worth more uh, in in pieces if he sold off the film library at Disneyland and this and that. If he sold off uh, all the assets, he would have been able to make more money. And so, you know, there was a lot of turmoil going on at the studio during that time. Uh, there was a management change out. Ron Miller uh, left uh, Disney, and they brought in Michael Eisner and Frank Wells and Jeffrey Katzenberg, and all those people came in. Mm -hmm. So it was a really interesting time uh, while that movie was being made. And, uh, and, a lot of the animation studios during that period, you know, you had like Hanna-Barbera and Ruby Spears and Filmation. They were doing a lot of the Saturday morning stuff. And that, and they were seasonal. You know, if you worked in Saturday morning, you could expect to work nine months out of the year and you were laid off for like three or four months out of the year. Wow. 
And so, you know, at Disney, there was this expectation, especially on the Black Cauldron, everybody knew there was going to be a layoff. And, and it just, uh, and there was. I mean, it was a pretty significant uh, layoff, I have to say, um, <clears throat> because they wound up tearing the animation department down, like I said earlier, or about uh, two-thirds of the department was let go. And uh, and then what was left of the animation department, they moved off the studio lot. And then you realize that the animation department was on that studio, uh, in that studio complex since 1939 when, when Walt built it and moved all the artists over from the Hyperion studio wow. in Silver Lake. He, he moved everybody over, so the animation department was, was on that uh, uh, property, you know, on the studio lot for all those years, and then in 1985, 86, they they moved this into a nondescript warehouse over in Glendale, right across the street from uh, the Imagineering facility where they designed the parks and the rides and attractions and whatnot. Wow. Yeah. So. So you, you know, it, it was it was definitely and a lot of turmoil and it was a lot of things happening at that time. You uh you mentioned uh, some of the guys who were working with the nine old men. Do you ever have a chance to work with any of those guys? Yeah, you know, I I, I got to know Eric Larson a little bit. Um, I had met Frank and Ollie a number of times uh, because I was in the effects department. I didn't really work directly with any of those guys. <clears throat> I met Ward, Ward Kimball and and Willie Ryderman. Um, who else did I? Uh, you know. To, some some of the old timers that you might not know, uh, people like uh, uh, Ted Berman, who was one of the directors on The Black Cauldron, right. and Joe Hale, who had been there for decades, he was producing the movie. Um, you know, I I got to know Elmer Plummer and Jack Hanna. Jack Hanna had directed a lot of the Donald Duck, Duck and Chippendale cartoons over the years. Oh. Uh, T.E. was another guy I got to know a little bit. So, you know, I, I, I'm sort of like a lot of those guys already started, you know, Ward Kimball, of course, you know, uh, sure. lectured up at Cal Arts a number of times. And so, you know, you kind of, you know, you met some of those people. And some of the character animators got to know those guys really well because that was their forte. I got I, I met Jack Buckley a number of times. Uh, he was an old effects animator that was on the tail end of his career and getting ready to retire, Jack and Jane Boyd. Um, or, or another two uh, that were doing a fax. So, you know, there was, um, it was a transition period. It really was. Well, yeah. when, you were, when you were working there and you were, you know, around some of those amazing creative minds and, and you're, you're walking the, ha- you know, as a Disney fan, I would say, walking the hallowed halls of Disney's studios. And, and granted, it was a, uh, it was a it was a transitionary time for the company as a whole. Did you ever have a, an opportunity to step back and just really savor uh, the opportunity and the experience that you were having? Yeah, you know, I think you know, for a lot of us, I think there's always that moment where you kind of step back for a second and pinch yourself and go, "Am I really here? Is this really happening?" Right. It was kind of you know uh, that sort of a feeling. And, and I, I could, frankly, was kind of like that uh, for my entire career. I still am like that. I still step back occasionally and go, wow, this is so cool, you know? And, uh, you know, it's, uh, but at the same time, you know, we were going from one picture to the next and just working our tails off on different projects. And one of the things I really kind of regret was I didn't take a lot of pictures early on. I wish I had. Um, you know, and, uh, certainly I, I, I'm envious of some of my colleagues who, who had taken pictures and even some motion picture footage of, you know, those days in the eighties when we were on, still on the studio a lot. Um, but I've become much more diligent about it, uh, in the last decade or so. Uh, and I, I really make it a point to, to take photos and, 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 and ask people if I could take a photo with them, you know? Right. Right. So, um, that's been kind of gratifying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Out of all of the film projects that you worked on, David, did you have a do you have a favorite? Do you have something you like? Oh wow! I'd, I'd go back and do that. <laughs> I, I always I, I literally always get asked this question, and you know what I tell people? I you know it's it's literally like having children. Yeah. You can't have a favorite child. Um, I mean, every one of the pictures that I I, I had the you know the absolute pleasure and honor to work on. Um, you know, each one of them holds special memories. There were challenges. There were things, new things we were trying to do. There was some groundbreaking stuff that we did on some of these pictures. And so I look at each one on its own for its own attributes and own memories. And having said that, I will tell you that the movie that, that really sort of leaps forward every time somebody asks me that question is Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And partly the reason why I bring that one up was I got a chance to live in London. It was my first time really living overseas. I got to work on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, Dick Williams um, was, uh, Richard Williams was the animation director. Bob Zemeckis was the overall live action film director. And uh, got to work with a really international crew of people. So, artists and animators from all over Europe and South America and Asia. Uh, and to this day, I still have friends all over the world because of that picture. So I always, I always bring that one up because that was just a, a real blast. To, and it was just a really great experience. Wow. So let me ask you this, because this is a, like, I guess, legendary Hoovering Roger Rabbit folklore. Did they actually put Michael Eisner's phone number on the billboard when Roger Rabbit crashes the car into the billboard? <laughs> uh, you know something? I, I couldn't tell you. Honestly, I don't know. I, I don't think so, but, I mean, who knows? You know, it was one of the funny things that we used to do uh, on some of these pictures is, you know, we'd insert our names here and there. We, you know, we'd do some funny things that were, were harmless, you right. know. Sure. Uh, and that kind of all went over the cliff when a few people did some things they shouldn't have done, you know. <laughs> like putting uh, Michael's phone but, number in the film. <laughs> what's that? Like putting Michael's phone number in a film. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, um, in uh, Runaway Brain, there's a, a scene where there's a little pink piece of paper. It's Jeffrey Katzenberg's pink slip, yeah, and and it, it, it flies it, it flies through the scene in like two frames. It, it, you can't really register it unless you stop frame it. But it's a pink sheet of paper that has the initials J K on it, and it was during that. Uh, short that we were working on that uh, Jeffrey left the company. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, you know, it's like these little tongue-in-cheek things that, that, that people do, you know, you, I can point to all kinds of pictures where, you know, there's people's names on things and, you know, uh, Bell is in the opening of uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame right. and uh, there's a satellite dish on a rooftop and a motorhome appears someplace in a period picture. <laughs> yeah, it's just like some just real sort of inside stuff and funny. Yeah. You know? Some that's of those cool. things become legends. That's great. Yeah. Um, let me ask. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. Um, for those of us who are not in the business or the industry, what does a visual effects animator animator actually do on a film? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So uh, I typically tell people, we, you know, we usually animate stuff that is not a character. So, you know, it's atmospheric effects, you know, rain, snow, water, waterfalls, ocean surfaces. I mean, you know, you, you look at a film like Pinocchio, the monster of the whale sequence, and, you know, there was the, you know, sort of those original... Uh, legendary effects animators uh, of the original effects department, people like George Rowley and uh, Hugo D'Orsi and Josh Metter. Uh, these guys were doing some phenomenal uh, effects animation uh, back in the day with uh, Snow White and Pinocchio and Fantasia um, and, and Bambi and all of those films. 
So, um, you know, that's pretty much what the effects animators do. Obviously, in the 90s, as uh, the computers were starting to come into, into production, uh, we started doing a lot of the inanimate objects on the computers, um, you know, the whole gear sequence in Great Mouse Detective. Um, there's uh, Pocahontas's canoe. We did a lot of work with Glenn Keane on uh, some of the sequences where, you know, he animated Pocahontas, and then we followed his lead uh, uh, in putting in the, uh, a, you know, digital canoe, um, those types of things. So, uh, you know, and as I rose up through the ranks, I mean, I became an effects animator, a supervising effects animator, eventually a visual effects supervisor, artistic coordinator, producer, creative director, director, all of those things. So, um, you know, it was just, you know, you just go along and you're, you're just uh, doing whatever you need to do to, to do something great and unique and fun. And, uh, and it's a very collaborative process. You're working with, uh, some immensely talented artists and, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of them. I mean, a film like The Lion King, I think, had something like 600 artists that worked on it. Wow. That's amazing. When you're, when you're in the, uh, when you're in the thick of things and you're trying to create a movie of all the different roles that you've had, is there a role that you really, I, I, I don't want to get into the favorite child conversation again, but, is there a role that you really prefer to be in? Is there a role that you're more comfortable with? Is one that you like uh, prefer other than uh, over something else? You know, I, I mean, I, I've always enjoyed doing everything that I've done. And, you know, the last uh, uh, probably 10, 10, 12 years I was at the studio, um, you know, I was heading up a special projects group. So, I really got to wear a lot of different hats. I used to tell people when I when I was heading that that group up uh, that I you know I did everything from janitorial to executive producing. So it was it was fun for me because I got to jump in. You know, if I had some animators working on something and we were trying to get it done, uh, even though I was the head of the department and, and supervising a team of people. Um, I oftentimes jumped on, jumped onto the board and, and helped, uh, you know, I was in between if I needed to, to help get a scene done, uh, so that we could meet the deadline. So, you know, for me, uh, I have to tell you, I never really looked at it as a job, you know, for me, I just love doing it all. Uh, and I still do, you know, but I, I think, you know, over the years you evolve and you're, you continue to grow. And that's for me, I continue to grow and, and do other things, and you know, I'm I'm writing a lot now. I've got a bunch of books out. I've got some new books coming up, and so I'm I've just been enjoying the heck out of out of it all. Yeah, enjoy the ride while you can. Yeah, yeah and you know, it's nice to be able to to write about some of these projects after the fact, and and be able to to give people a real glimpse of how the movies got done. Uh, you know, I was able to do that with uh, my book on Destino, Dolly and Disney Destino. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a new book coming out next year on the making of The Nightmare Before Christmas uh, that, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to uh, a lot of the key people that, that made that movie happen. And, and I actually happened to work on it just a little bit, uh, which was fun. But, I, you know... To me, it's almost like uh, a reunion to go back and, and uh, interview a lot of these people because I know them. You know, I interview them, uh, uh, interview somebody that you had worked with 25 years ago on a project. So um, that book is coming out next June um, uh, in time for D23 out here in Los Angeles. Oh, and, uh, great. Yeah, and, and I've got... I've got another book project I'm working on right now on uh, all the animation furniture that was designed by Ken Weber, who designed the Disney Studios uh, in Burbank back in 1939. Wow. And as part of that whole complex, you know, Walt was trying to make this utopian sort of animation studio campus. Um, and the, the, the architects, you know, Ken, Ken Weber was an architect and designer. And uh, their philosophy was a holistic design philosophy. So it was not only just building the structure, 
but it was also designing the interiors and all the furnishings that went into it. And so, you know, Weber worked with uh, uh, Frank Thomas on coming up with the design for the perfect animation desk, you know. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this furniture that was built in 1939 specific to the different disciplines like layout, background, animation, story, uh, they, they have specialty furniture design for those disciplines, and nobody's really done any documentation on it. So I kind of took that on as a project to do because I'm actually, as I'm talking to you guys, I am sitting at a 1939 Ken Weber Disney animation desk oh, wow. that the studio gave to me when I left. Wow. We're not jealous. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, you know, it, 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 you know there's, there's so many little things that, you know, are going to get lost to time if people yeah. don't sit down and decide, hey, you know, we should document this. And that's what I decided to do. Well, actually, while I was writing on this desk, I was writing the Nightmare Before Christmas book the next year. Um, I sort of sat back for a second and I started looking at the desk. And thinking to myself, I wonder if anybody's documented this. And I wound up blowing the afternoon. I was supposed to be writing on this on the Nightmare Project, and I wound up blowing the afternoon doing some research to see if there was anything uh, written up about it. And there really wasn't much of anything. Wow. So that book is coming out. Hopefully, uh, I think it's coming out in November of this year. Wow. Oh, good. That's amazing. We we talk to a lot of different people. Uh, at different levels of, you know, the the process with with the animation, or they worked with Walt, or, you know, they they were some of the original people who worked at Disneyland when it first opened, and we say the yeah. exact same thing that you're talking about. You know, I I don't know if if Disney just wasn't thinking about it, or if it was just, you know, everything was moving along at light speed and nobody really stopped to think, hey, we really need to probably archive this in such a way that. You know, we're saving some of these stories because, you know, we're not always going to have Alice Davis and we're not always going to have Bob Gurr. And we're not always going to have uh, all these greats that, you know, we're losing these stories that these people pass away. So I, I, I applaud you for for doing that, because yeah. when, you, when you mentioned the furniture, I remember reading about that a couple of years ago and uh, it was fascinating. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to when that book comes out so I can read more about it. Yeah. And, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think, I think there's a lot of people that are doing the right thing and, and they're starting to do oral histories and they're starting to do all kinds of documentation and there's a lot of people doing research on various things and they're finding a lot of uh, journals and papers that belong to a lot of these old-timers that work at Disney and a lot of that stuff is getting archived properly. And, and I, I really applaud all those folks that are doing that kind of work. And, you know, and I'm contributing in my little way uh, with some of the projects I'm working on. But it is, it, it's an important thing. It's, it's, it's a document. It's, it's, it's really, you know, being able to document the history of all of this stuff uh, for future generations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it's important. Another book project I'm actually... Uh, trying to get off the ground right now is on Claude Coates, who, who was one of the premier background painters uh, back in uh, the late 30s, and he worked on all the features from Snow White, the Seven Dwarfs, to uh, Lady and the Tramp, and then he was one of the original uh, Imagineers, handpicked by Walt Disney, to uh, basically design Disneyland. And, you know, he wound up, uh, he was the show designer for Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, he was the show designer for uh, the uh, Sub Ride, Alice in Wonderland, the Haunted Mansion. I mean, he, he just did an amazing amount of projects, not only on Disneyland, but also for uh, Walt Disney World when that was being built. Uh, and he also did some work on Tokyo Disneyland before he retired. And he, he was with the company for like 54 years. So I'm working with his son, Alan, who's an Imagineer in his own right. Uh, I'm working with him uh, to try and get a book about his father, Claude, uh, uh, put together. And um, so, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of really cool projects that 
I've got my hands on and I'm uh, looking forward to getting getting completed in the next couple of years. Yeah, that sounds great too. Because, uh, like you know, like you said, if nobody tells these stories, who's gonna be around to tell them? So. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, and a lot of these stories are really fascinating, I think. You know, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of interesting things, interesting behind-the-scenes things that I think the fans would absolutely love, especially, you know, people that, you know, love Pirates of the Caribbean or the Haunted Mansion. There, there's some interesting behind-the-scenes stories that, that are going to be aha moments for people, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, hey, before we get into uh, Oswald, the book, uh, what was your yeah. role in uh, the World of Color and the Disney Dreams uh, show? Uh, I was the uh, essentially the producer, creative director of all the animation that went into that show. Wow. Uh, you know, a lot of it, yes, it's repurposed from the various films, but also we did some really cool things where we created new animation, uh, uh, to hook scenes together from the original films and not just make it a clip show, uh, but make it a uh, sort of a new experience of familiar material for people. Uh, and I had a real blast. We had an incredible team of people working on the World of Color and also uh, the Paris Dream Show. Uh, and I also did a show over at um, uh, the uh, Disney Seas Park in Tokyo as well. Uh, and those are night, these nighttime spectaculars or outdoors. They're fantastic. I mean, over in Paris, we did uh, we we did all new animation of Quasimodo, essentially uh, climbing the uh, Disneyland Paris castle, singing hmm. out there in, in French. Wow! Uh, and, and it was really fantastic. Yeah, because I would think some of the animation is like you were saying, just kind of clips, and then some of it almost has to be kind of integrated between, you know, one scene to the next scene to to make it flow. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we 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 did we you know again we did a lot of what we refer to as bridge animation right. and new animation uh, to hook things together uh, to extend scenes longer uh, for the purposes of these new shows. But the World of Color show was really the groundbreaker, I thought. And uh, the the show director was uh, Steve Davidson uh, uh, over at uh, Imagineering. And he was, he was just a joy to work with. And he was sort of the uber guy in charge. And I think he did a pretty fantastic job of, of putting that, all the pieces together. Because, you know, they... They put. They had to install 1,800 fountains yeah. uh, in the lagoon at California Adventure. Uh, they actually invented a new LED lighting system that got patented. Uh, that so each one of the fountains has its own LED lighting system underwater. I mean, it's just phenomenal stuff. That you know, uh, there were just all kinds of technical issues that had to be solved to be able to do that show. Yeah. And, uh, and and it's amazing that it, it just because I I go down there periodically and I'll see that show and it's just it's amazing to see you know five thousand people just going nuts for it right right so um we've kind of teased it earlier uh, tell us about the book that you wrote Oswald the Lucky Rabbit the search for the lost Disney cartoons yeah so you know it was kind of interesting like. I you know I, t I tell the whole story about how I got involved with it in the book and I, I'm not I won't recap it for you right now but uh, what was interesting was as I got involved with that project it just seemed to me like half of the half the uh, the 26 cartoons were missing they, there were no prints on them when when the Walt Disney Company got uh, the rights to the Walt Disney directed Oswald cartoons back from Universal. Um, they only had prints for like half the titles. The other half were what we call lost or missing. Uh, there was there was no print for them, and so one uh, title, Hungry Hobos, turned up in an auction. It was a 16 millimeter copy, and um, and I I got the company to uh, agree to purchase it. They, they allocated some funding, and they allowed me to go bid on it. And so we got that cartoon, and we did a restoration to it, and 
Uh, my friend Mark Waters, who's a composer, added a, a score to it. Nice. Uh, and, you know, because we found that one, uh, it just seemed logical that there would be others out there, and we just had to go beat the bushes for them. And so we brought on a consultant, a, a, friend, a guy who's become a friend of mine, David Gerstein, and he's like a detective for this stuff. And he went out and was beating some of the uh, film archives over in Europe. And we wound up finding, we found a title in Austria. We found one in Norway. We found one in Belgium. We found a couple in England. Uh, so right now, there's, uh, there was originally 13. Now there's 19. We found an additional six. And I'm still, even though I'm not at the company now as a full-time employee, I'm, I'm still doing some work with, with different groups there, uh, here and there, but um, I'm still looking for those lost Oswalds. There's still seven of them missing, and uh, we have a line on one of the missing titles, so we're, we're seeing if we can get a digital scan of that so we can do a restoration and add some music to it. So it's a process, and... It, it, it was really uh, interesting because as I started getting involved with it, you know, it was because he had lost mm -hmm. the contract for, um, you know, because he lost the contract for Oswald, um, all the information kind of went to the wind. You know, there was oh. stuff at Universal, there was some stuff at Disney, there was stuff at the Disney Family Museum up in San Francisco. There was uh, we even found some material at the New York Public Library in New York City. Nice. So uh, it was really, it was really about aggregating all of this material and putting it into one authoritative book that is on that character. And it really is the only book on Oswald the Lucky Rabbit that aggregates everything we know at this moment in time. Wow. wow. So, you know, what are the, uh, you know, how did Oswald get his start? We know, uh, you know, Disney created it, but, you know, what was the, you know, what was the reason? Was he trying to sell this? Uh, you know, what, you know, tell us a little backstory on Oswald. Yeah, I mean, the backstory is really that um, Walt and his brother founded the company in 1923, and uh, the Winkler Film Corporation, which was run by Margaret Winkler, uh, she uh, signed Walt uh, to distribute his Alice comedies films. And they wound up doing between 1923 and 1927, uh, they did like 57 of these Alice comedies, which were one, one reeler silent uh, comedies. Uh, the one reeler is like an eight to ten minute film, you know. And uh, most of those cartoons are somewhere around seven or seven or eight. And at the time, the Fleischer Brothers Studios, who were based in New York, they were doing uh, what was known as the Out of the Inkwell series with Coco the Clown. And it was this animated character that would come out of an inkwell, this Coco the Clown would come out of the inkwell in the live action world. So what Walt did with the Alice comedies was he sort of twisted that and he put a live-action girl, Alice, into an animated world. And so she had uh, an animated sidekick named Julius the Cat. And as they were doing the series, the live-action of Alice became less and less and less as they went along, and the animation became more and more dominant. And Julius the Cat began looking more and more like Felix the Cat, who was extremely popular. Felix the Cat was from the Pat Sullivan studio in New York. Right. And so because Felix was so popular, Walt was being pushed to make Julius look like Felix the Cat. And when you look at some of the later Alice comedies, it's like he looks really like Felix the Cat. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so... They felt like they had run the they, they had run the course with that series, and uh, uh, Margaret's husband, a guy named Charles Mintz, uh, said you know he wanted to have Walt develop a all animated series, and uh, Universal was interested in getting an all animated series uh, to from them, and so 
what wound up happening was uh, they, the, you had Felix the cat, you had Crazy Cat. Uh, you know, there was a lot of cat characters yeah. uh, during that time period that were popular. And so rather than doing a cat, he did something completely different, a rabbit, long ears. And it had a distinctive look to it that was different from what was going on. And so he winds up doing the first one, Poor Papa, uh, and uh, he gets a lot of critical notes from Mintz and from Universal that Oswald looks too old, there's too much cycled animation, you know, they've got a bunch of notes. And, you know, Walt took the, took the criticism uh, and applied, uh, you know, uh, all the fixes he was going to do to uh, the second one, which is Trolley Trouble. And Trolley Trouble became the first Oswald cartoon released to theaters, and it was an instant hit. It was really Walt's first big animation hit. And during the contract, he had to do 26 Oswald cartoons, and they were doing one about every two and a half, three weeks, uh, which is really amazing when you think about it. Right. And uh, Walt felt like he wasn't getting enough money. Mintz was always critical of Walt and the quality of the cartoons. So they had a sort of somewhat um, a tenuous relationship. They they were constantly at odds. And what Walt didn't realize was he didn't own the character, even though he and Ub Iwerks designed um, uh, Oswald. Um, they didn't own it. And so Walt went back to New York, where Mintz was based with with the Winkler Company and wanted to get more money, and little did he know, uh, but uh, uh, Charles Mintz's brother-in-law, Margaret Winkler's husband, uh, brother, uh, George, uh, basically signed a lot of the Disney artists away from, from Walt behind his back and set up the Oswald Cartoon Studio in Hollywood, and uh, Mintz took the second contract of 26 uh, Oswald cartoons. And Walt was devastated. And he and Ub Iwerks created Mickey Mouse. And I'm giving you a very condensed version of this. But he and, he, he, he and Ub Iwerks created Mickey Mouse. And the first three Mickey cartoons, which were uh, Plain Crazy, Steamboat Willie, and Galloping Gauchos, those were done at Walt and his brother Roy's house. They were neighbors uh, on Lyric Street in Silver Lake. They had, their houses were next to each other. Mm -hmm. And on weekends and at night, they were doing animation on those cartoons in the garage. Uh, Ub was working with them. They had one or two other loyal artists that stuck around. And um, Lillian Disney, Walt's wife, and Edna Disney, Roy O's wife, were painting cells on their kitchen tables uh, to get those cartoons finished because during the day, Walt had to finish out his Oswald obligation. And so he was already working on uh, the Mickeys at night and on weekends six months before they finished off the Oswald contract. So uh, once... Once he put uh, sound to Steamboat Willie and released it in November of 1928, boom, that was, that was it. It was a huge sensation. Mickey Mouse just skyrocketed, eclipsed Oswald. Uh, after Mintz did the, first, the second 26 cartoons, Universal took it away from him and gave it to Walter Lance. And Walter Lance did Oswald shorts until about 1938. Uh, and Oswald's design really changed from the the Disney version. He kind of changed in over like you know an eight or nine year period. He kind of morphed into what I I refer to as the Nesquik bunny. You know, he, he just started looking like a realistic bunny. So, um, but that's kind of in a nutshell. So those twenty six cartoons that Walt had done. Um, you know, we give a, uh, a a breakdown of each one of the cartoons, including the lost ones, because we we were able to find scripts, uh, we were able to sign, find storyboards, some animation drawings for those lost cartoons. So we were able to cobble together 
what each one of those cartoons is about, and, and we have some images and stuff uh, mixed in with that uh, text so that people get a good sense of what those lost cartoons look like. Wow. Yeah. Uh, as we start to wrap up here real quickly, could you, could you tell everybody how Oswald came back into the Disney family? Because that's a fascinating story. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's a really terrific story, and, and I think everybody in the Disney fandom has to uh, applaud Bob Iger, the CEO of the Walt Disney Company, because really Bob Iger was the guy that made that whole thing happen. Yeah. And, uh, and he, you know, when he became CEO, um, he, and he told me this to my face. I, I had a lovely conversation with him. Uh, he basically said, that he had a handful of things he wanted to do, and on that list of things he wanted to do was he wanted to get Oz, the, the Walt Disney directed Oswald back to the company mm-hmm. because it was really part of the historical timeline of the company. And, and I think that was a great call because, you know, uh, in five years we're going to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Walt Disney Company mm-hmm. um, in, in 2023. So I think it's really important to, to fill in those those little missing uh, bits along the Disney timeline, and getting Oswald back was hugely important. And the opportunity came up when the NFL contracts came up for renewal, and there was a bit of a shuffle. And uh, uh, long story short, um, uh, John Madden and Al Michaels and, and that team of sportscasters w- wanted to go over to Universal NBC to do, I think, Sunday Night Football. Or I always get them confused. I have, I'd have to reference my own book because uh, that's the stories in the book. But the uh, the interesting thing is is that um, uh, uh, Madden was able to go over, but Al Michaels who was under a long term contract at ESPN. And so Michaels wanted to go to uh, uh, NBC Universal with John Madden and his team uh, because they had been working together for so many years. And so uh, Bob was able to pick up the phone and call his counterpart at Universal and said they would release uh, Al Michaels from his contract, but he wanted the Oswald cartoon sack. And And it's really funny to hear Bob talk about that because you know, Bob was basically, when he said it, people were like, Oswald who? They didn't even know they even owned it over there uh-huh. because it had been dormant for so many years. Yeah. And so that's really how um, Oswald was able to be repatriated to the Walt Disney Company was because of Al Michaels and the NFL contract and everything. Hey, hey. That's crazy. Do you, do you ever think that we'll see maybe now more Oswald animation and maybe Oswald. You know, I think I think that you know Oswald is is gaining in popularity uh, year over year. They keep doing more merchandise. If you go into Disney's California Adventure out at the Disneyland Resort in Anaheim, um, you know, as soon as you walk in the front gate uh, to the left, there's Oswald's gas station, and it's just this venue filled with Oswald merchandise. They have an Oswald walk around character. Um, you know, over in Japan, uh, they're off the charts with the amount of uh, Oswald merchandise and stuff that they have over there. They love Oswald. Um, and, you know, I suspect that they're going to start doing more and more. And, you know, I, I don't have any inside information. All I can tell you is I, I believe that. The, the more popular the character gets with the fans uh, and the more fans want to see more of Oswald, the more the company will do stuff. Because, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's all about guest experiences with the Walt Disney Company. And they want to give the, they want to give the fans and the guests, you know, things that they're asking for. And they, and they, they try to do a, a, as much as possible on that front. So my guess is, is that there'll be more and more stuff in the coming years with Oswald. All right. All right. Well, uh, it has been a fascinating uh, conversation, David. And we, A, we would love to have you on the show again to talk about more of your books. Uh, but as we finally wrap it up, 
how can people find you on the internet, find out more about your books and your projects and anything else that you're involved in you'd like yeah. to share? I, I, have, uh, I have a website, davidbossard.com. Uh, all one word, davidbossard.com. And, you know, if you go there, there's a whole bunch of tabs across the uh, top of the site. Uh, you can see the books uh, that are available. There's links to wherever you want to, you know, shop. If you go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Books A Million, uh, you have your choice. Um, there's, uh, there's also some free material up there. Um, I, I've been doing book plates for some of the books, which uh, is an adhesive uh, uh, that, you know, it's a sticker essentially that uh, if somebody lives in a far off place that I may not get to to do book signings, uh, they can just send a self-addressed stamped envelope uh, to me and I'll sign a book plate related to one of the books and mail it back to them. And they can just stick it in the book, and they'll have an autographed copy of their book. That's awesome. Um, so, so there's free bookmarks, there's free book plates, there's, uh, you know, there's a, there's some articles that I've been publishing over the years. So there's more material about Disney that people can read on the site. So you can find me on on uh, at davidbosser.com, and then at that site, there's also links to my Facebook page and my LinkedIn page. So if people want to friend me on Facebook, I've, I've actually been putting up some kind of uh, some interesting uh, concept paintings for the Walt Disney Studios uh, in 1938-39 uh, as I'm working on this book. Which, by the way, I'd love to come back on and talk to you yes. guys about uh, maybe in October. Uh, uh, as the as the book is launching, absolutely, yeah. we'd yeah. love to have you. Yeah, and uh, we will yeah. link so, up your website on our uh, on our post when the show goes live. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, absolutely, I love you guys to uh, put up some of those links for people. Sure. Uh, but davidbosser dot com, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Uh, I do a little bit on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter if you want. Uh, I've been starting to put more and more up on Twitter. Uh, so, yeah, I'm pretty active on social media because, I, you know, there's, there's a whole community of people out there that uh, uh, want to see material and see what we're up to. And uh, I've got some book signings coming up, and, and I'm doing a book signing with Don Hahn and Mindy Johnson. Don's got his um, Yesterday Tomorrow's book yeah. out. Yeah. And Mindy Johnson has a fantastic book out yeah. on uh, Ink and Paint, the women of Walt Disney Animation Studios. Yeah. Uh, it's a really fantastic, fantastic book. She's She and Don and I are going to be in Las Vegas in mid-June signing books at the Magical Memories Gallery at the Forum Shops at Caesars Palace. Oh, cool. And that's a big Disney art gallery. And then uh, in July, we're going to be up in Seattle at the Northwest Mouse Meets, uh, a big summer event. They have a big weekend event, so we're going up there. We're going to do a whole bunch of, you know, we're going to do some screenings and book signings and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, there's always something going on. I, I do have a newsletter associated with my website, so... Uh, if people want to uh, sign up for the newsletter, I promise I will not be hitting you with tons of stuff. But, you know, maybe once every four to six weeks, I might send out a note to the people on the newsletter, just letting them know if I'm going to be doing a book signing or letting them know about a new project or something like that. So uh, I love to hear from people. And, and I do, believe it or not, answer people. <laughs> if people send me questions through the website, and I, I helped out a, 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 a girl uh, in junior high uh, on a, uh, a paper she was writing. She needed to interview somebody. She wanted to interview me, and I, I helped her out, and she got 100. I found out from wow. her grandfather. She got 100 on the paper, and so I was very happy about that. Still making magic happen, <laughs> man. That's awesome. That's very cool. That's really you know, cool. It, it's you know something. It, it, it's like if if you're not having fun, you shouldn't be doing it. And I'm right. just having a ball, so I'm doing as much as I possibly can right now. Right, right. Yeah, that's great. We really can't thank you enough for your uh, your time and uh, telling us all these great stories. And uh, we'll definitely have you back on in October when the new book launches. So that'll be great. 
Can't wait to. Uh... Yeah, and 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 certainly next year, guys, when we do the uh, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas book, because I got to tell you, that is just going to be uh, really phenomenal. You know. That'd be great. Uh, I think I, I think people are gonna go crazy if you, if you you know I reached out to fans because I wanted to include fans in the afterlife portion of the book uh, because there's so many fans out there that have tattoos of those characters on oh, yeah. them and so we're gonna include some of that material in the book. It's it's really been a lot of fun and a real joy to work on that project. Yeah, yeah. Was it? I think it was last year they had. Uh... Uh, the two characters at the Magic Kingdom for the Halloween party, and the line just didn't stop right. all night long. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no. I, 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 it, there's a film that just keeps getting bigger and bigger year over year, you know, and and it, it's amazing to watch it because it was such a personal project for Tim Burton, right. um, and, and and I think he's just elated by you know the how it's resonated with so many fans right yeah, yeah. yeah. that's great all right well thanks uh, for coming all right and uh we'll... yeah guys it was terrific tony john i really appreciate you guys uh having me on and and i'd love to come back and be on again and uh and i thank all of your fans for listening yeah. absolutely all right and we'll see you in the park the disney parks podcast is not affiliated with the walt disney company all disney parks attractions lands shows event names etc are registered trademarks of the walt disney company like a out of the blue fate steps in and sees you through